Cardinals and Brewers, no score, top second. Mark McGuire changed that in a second when he oh, got it. Every last inch of the baseball. 445 feet away. Would have kept going if it wasn't for that large Miller sign in center field. That was the sound of the Sports Center crew recapping the games played on September 10th, 2001. He was talking about Mark McGuire's career home run number 578 rattling off the center field sign at Miller Park. McGuire went on to hit five more career home runs before hanging up the cleats on a tumultuous career, one that to this day sparks controversy. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country in New York, Yankees pitcher Roger Clemens was aiming for his 20th win of the season against the Boston Red Sox, a rivalry that had yet to truly be renewed. However, the expected 50,000 fans had to wait after a rainstorm found its way through the concrete jungle of New York City, postponing the game for a later date. But this story isn't about Mark McGuire, or Roger Clemens, or even the rivalry between the Red Sox and Yankees. It's a glimpse into what life was like on and after September 10th, 2001. It's a story of how a few days in late September began the healing from an event Americans and the world alike would never forget. This, Justin, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning. That a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't know anything more than that. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That looks like a second plane. We're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington, and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. We are getting reports that a part of... The tower, the second tower, uh, has collapsed. United Airlines flight number 93. It went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Both trade towers, where thousands of people work, have now been attacked and destroyed. There is simply no way to accurately describe the emotion this evokes. On September 11th, 2001, 2000, 996 people lost their lives in what was the largest and most publicly broadcasted display of terrorism in human history. It's a day that everybody with a conscious memory at that point in time can recall exactly where they were when it happened. It put the world on pause, and for our story's sake, it put a baseball world on pause. With MLB Commissioner Bud Selig's word, America's pastime was put on brief hold at first for a day, but that later turned to five. Americans weren't ready to resume life as normal, and reasonably so. Flights had been grounded indefinitely. New York schools, which were freshly started from summer break, were closed. The New York Stock Exchange, a place of usual chaos and nonstop action, was at a halt. And across the country, more of the same was taking place in various walks of life. This would be the norm in the days to come as America attempted to pick itself back up again. If you're anything like me, chances are that when something negative happens, you turn to something or someone to look for guidance or inspiration. As humans, we're optimistic by nature, and only pessimistic by choice. So to look for positivity amongst the darkness is normal. For Americans looking to heal following that fateful day, all of us pondered and looked for that positivity. With a world on pause, it was difficult for anyone to find that semblance of optimism. However, a glimpse of hope would soon be on the horizon in the shape of a Queens-based baseball team by the name of the New York Mets. This band of historically lovable losers were in the midst of a high point in their franchise history. Having a winning record in each of their previous four seasons entering 2001, which included two deep playoff runs including a World Series loss in the year prior. As for the 01 season, the New York Mets started the year 35-47 and 47 through the end of June with a run differential of negative 77. To say they were struggling would be an understatement. And not often does a reigning league champion from the year prior struggle so mightily. The Mets improved a little bit in the months of July and August with a 29-24 and 24 record. They finished September 9th with a 16-5 and 5 run and had Mets fans starting to think they could make the playoffs. Following a series against the Florida Marlins in which they took two of three games, the Mets traveled from Miami to Pittsburgh to square off against the Pirates. Or so they thought. In the early hours of September 11th, the Mets arrived to their hotel and settled in at around 3 a.m. It's routine for teams to immediately leave a city by plane and arrive late that same night into wherever they're staying. In this case, it was Pittsburgh that would play host to the Mets and their travels with their off day in the 10th being a buffer. Mets Hall of Famer and second baseman Edgardo Alfonso woke to a missed call at around 9 a.m. from his wife. She knew they traveled into the late hours of the night, so when he woke to a missed call, he knew something was out of the norm. He called her back, and her six-word sentence was something that many Americans were telling each other. Put the news on. Something happened. 
Alfonso had turned the television on shortly after the first plane had struck the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Todd Zeal, like many Americans that morning, were unsure of what disaster had unfolded at the Twin Towers. His quote to AM New York in an article published on the 20th anniversary of the attack reads, At first it seemed like a really bizarre random story of a plane out of its flight path ending up in the tower, he said. And then watching it live as the second one struck, it became a totally different feeling. All it took was the span of 17 minutes to have those watching live go from a state of mind in which it was assumed to be an accident to everyone realizing America was under attack. Now with both towers ablaze, nearly every New York Mets player was glued to their television set, looking on at the events unfolding live. Many of the players had deeper connections to the city just beyond playing there. John Franco is from Brooklyn, and Al Leiter is from Toms River, New Jersey. Additionally, Todd Zeal was living in New York City and felt as strong of a connection to it as one could. Unfortunately, instant relief wasn't to be found for John Franco. Johnny tried calling home. The line was out. The service was off completely. It was scary, said Alfonso. Within an hour of the towers being struck, both would fall. In all, there were four planes that made up the attacks and were not limited to the two in New York City. There was a plane that crashed into a side of the Pentagon, and then an unaccounted plane rumored to be heading towards Pittsburgh. Amidst that speculation, the Mets used their resources available to them and grabbed two buses to a remote hotel from the immediate risk area. All they could do from there was wait. In a time where everyone was in a complete state of shock, the world, as mentioned prior, was on pause. The Mets wouldn't play their scheduled game on the evening of September 11th, and instead they made their way back to New York in the late hours of the night. Typically, bus rides in the MLB consist of constant chatter and livelihood. This ride, however, was one that anyone on board will never forget. I remember it being quiet, and generally MLB bus rides aren't quiet. Many of the times we travel, everyone has a pretty good time, but this one was quiet. Very somber, and everyone was in disbelief. I don't think anyone knew how to handle that situation with us being in our 20s and 30s, said Glendon Rush, a starting pitcher for the Mets. Even the little camaraderie that they were able to get going along that seven-hour road trip was immediately halted when they got to the George Washington Bridge. The view from the bridge would typically be a breathtaking display of New York City and the engineering marvels that were the Twin Towers. When they crossed the bridge at 2 a.m., the view was a look at the horror that had unfolded almost a mere 16 hours earlier. I remember seeing fire and smoke and wreckage from a distance, said Rush. That area was kind of a glow with fire and orange. Very sad to see what was going on, and it only got worse once we really took in the magnitude of what was happening. The players crowded the right side of the bus to get a glimpse of the floodlights shining through the smoke of where the towers had once stood. The only sound that broke the dead silence was the sound of crying from those that had closer and more personal connections to the city. In the days that followed, Shea Stadium, the home of the New York Mets, was designated as a first responder triage center. It had all of the infrastructure that would have been needed at the time. However, due to the nature of the collapse of the towers, recovery of victims was minimal, and the plans to turn Shea Stadium into a pop-up morgue of sorts were rendered needless. As a response, manager Bobby Valentine urged his team to help the workers at Ground Zero. After players and staff took the needed time to be with family, many were ready to help Valentine's mission. They gathered supplies like work boots, water bottles, and batteries. On top of the supplies sent to Ground Zero, five players including Mike Piazza, Todd Zeal, Robin Ventura, John Franco, and Al Leiter all went to pay a visit to those inside the restricted zone. The moment wasn't lost on Todd Zeal, who at first was hesitant to visit. He saw the workers' moods shift in a positive way. The first of the first responders we saw, we could see a total change in their face when they saw the guys in their Mets hats. It was an instantaneous break from what they were going through for a week at that time. That put us at ease and gave us some feeling of purpose, Zeal told AM New York. If nothing else, maybe we gave these guys a few minutes to kind of take a break from the absolute trauma that they must be feeling and looking through this rubble for bodies of their friends, people they lost, people they're unsure about what they're going to find. After a little bit of deliberation about whether to continue the season following 9-11, players and their teams made the decision to continue. The choice to carry on with the season would be a way of healing for fans, players, and coaches, or anyone who loves baseball. The Mets returned to Pittsburgh to resume the suspended series from the days prior. In what would be a usual away game, Mets fans traveled in the masses to cheer on their team. Support would be a common theme, as Todd Zeal received an FDNY hat from the son and widow of a rescue worker who died at the World Trade Center. He donned the cap in the games following the attacks, 
along with the rest of the Mets when they traded their caps in for other New York first responder affiliations. The MLB granted permission for the team to wear the hats during batting practice only, but eventually that shifted to the entirety of the first game in Pittsburgh. Hey, this is Major League Baseball, said Todd Zeal on the subject of MLB, notifying the team that they have to resume wearing their Mets caps. We decided as a team that that simply was not going to happen. The MLB was flexible in their request, and upon their return to New York on September 21st, the Mets had worn the first responder hats in three consecutive games. Zeal was outspoken about the MLB and their request to change the hats back to the Mets, even after their return to New York. They're going to have to pry these hats off our heads, Zeal said. The TBS broadcast even made mention of this hot topic in the Mets' first game back at home. The Mets would like to continue to wear these caps for the rest of the season. Now, Major League Baseball mandates that uniforms and all caps and accessories conform to strict requirements. And so they've needed to receive special permission to wear these caps. Permission that we are told is scheduled to be discontinued after tonight. But there are some defiant people in that Mets dugout who say that no matter what Major League Baseball or MLB properties might say, they want to wear those caps for the remainder of the season. So it'll be interesting to see what results. Ten years later, in an article written by Tim Kirkjian of ESPN, Zeal was quoted as saying about that classic line, We were all in this together. It was so symbolic. It was so representative of New York. Major League Baseball knew they were fighting a losing battle. They saw value in what we were doing. They considered it futile to fight us on it. And futile it was. The Mets finished the season wearing around 15 different New York-affiliated emergency service hats. With tributes in full bloom across Shea Stadium on September 21st, 2001, the New York Mets became the first team to play at home in New York since the attacks. Not only that, but they were still in the middle of a great run of games that saw them closing in on a potential playoff push. The Mets swept the Pirates in their three games there and were red hot, winners of 19 of their previous 24 total games. With the stage set for one of the most anticipated games in their franchise history, the Mets and rival Atlanta Braves were set to kick off at 7.35 p.m. local time in front of 41,000 fans. The game had plenty of storylines and connections for the players that made up both rosters. In summary, on the Braves' side, Mark DeRosa is from Pesek, New Jersey, a town that is a stone's throw from Manhattan. Steve Carse from Flushing, New York, a neighborhood of Queens, which is home to the New York Mets. Dave Martinez from New York City. Mike Remlinger from Middletown, New York, a town only 70 miles from Times Square, and BJ Serhoff from the Bronx, New York. As for the Mets, the ones directly affiliated by birth or youth were mostly mentioned earlier, but worth noting again. These players are John Franco of Brooklyn, New York, Al Leiter of Toms River, New Jersey, and CJ Nitkowski of Suffern, New York. However, one of the stories that doesn't get brought up a lot on the topic of this game is perhaps one of the most tragic connections. Jason Marquis, the man the Braves called on to start the game that evening, was connected to the tax as well. Having grown up in Staten Island, this tragedy was heavy on the heart for him, but made even more so with the fact that his friend and former Little League World Series teammate, Michael Camarada, was one of the firefighters missing from the attacks. Camarada was later confirmed as a victim and was last seen conducting fire operations at the Marriott Hotel at the foot of the World Trade Center. For Marquis, this start was as meaningful to him as the men he was pitching against. Meanwhile, in opposition to Marquis, Bruce Chen, a native to Panama, got the call to pitch for the Mets. His Mets tenure to this point in time was off to a rocky start. He was acquired by the Mets via trade in late July of 2001. In his first eight games with the new ball club, he posted a misleading 3-1 record to the tune of a 4.37 ERA in 45.1 innings. In the start prior to the one to the 21st of September, Chen had his worst outing of the year. He recorded only one out and allowed three earned runs before being pulled. To add all of that up for the fifth-year player, he was pitching against his former team, a team in which he started and played his first two and a half years of his career with. With both pitchers and their teammates highly motivated to perform well, the stage was set. It's the start of the top of the fourth inning. Both teams to this point have struggled to get any leverage against either starter. The only traffic on the base paths were a Mike Piazza double, for the Mets in the first inning, and a Ray Sanchez single in the third inning for the Braves. Aside from those hits, both pitchers are cruising. Bruce Chen enters the inning already at 57 pitches. He has gone deep into counts with the majority of each of the 10 batters he's faced so far, in which seven batters maintained a two-strike count. Command is looking sharp for Chen on this beautiful 71-degree September night. The first true sign of trouble for him comes with one out in the fourth inning, 
when future Hall of Famer Chipper Jones singles to notch just the second Braves hit of the game. Two batters later, Ken Caminiti doubles to right field, but a close play in which catcher Mike Piazza struggled to corral the throw puts the Braves on top for the first run of the game. Their scoring concluded in the inning just one batter later on an Andrew Jones ground out. Identical to Chen, Jason Marquis enters the fourth inning, getting to a two-strike count on seven of his first ten batters as well. Only he has 41 pitches, 16 less than Chen to this point. However, the Mets won't go down quietly in response to the Braves, grabbing the lead earlier in the inning. Mike Piazza, ever the dangerous hitter, rips a double for his second one of the game. A Robin Ventura single moves him to third base to put runners in the corners. With only one out, the Mets have some room to play with, which is perfect for Sayoshi Shinjo, the next batter. On the third pitch of the at-bat, Shinjo lofts the ball to right field, deep enough to score Piazza from third base on a sacrifice fly. Two batters later, the fourth inning concludes with an updated score of 1-1. One one. Bruce Chen cruises through the fifth inning, only needing 11 pitches to get him by. With the home crowd anxious and ready to burst, the Mets put runners on second and third base, with Mike Piazza stepping up to the plate again. Unfortunately, the long seven-pitch at-bat results in a ground out, wiping away the opportunity to put the Mets on top. The sixth inning remains uneventful as both Chen and Marquis need only a combined 23 pitches to get through the inning without any issue. The Braves in the top of the seventh have a golden opportunity to play show stealer with runners on first and third with two outs. That opportunity does not come to pass as Ray Sanchez grounds out to end the threat. Bobby Cox, the Braves' manager, starts off the bottom of the seventh by replacing Jason Marquis with Steve Reed for two clean outs. Reed would then get pulled for one of the game's New York natives, Mike Remlinger. He retired the only batter he faced. Entering the eighth inning, Shea Stadium's scoreboard still reads 1-1. One one. John Franco, one of the aforementioned New York natives, took over on the mound for Bruce Chen. The final line on each starter were as follows. Marquis, with six innings, pitched to the tune of four strikeouts, only allowing one earned run while giving up seven hits. And as for Bruce Chen, he maintained over seven innings while striking out five and allowing six hits. Both pitchers were stellar. What more could America have asked for? A close game with the flair for the dramatic. This was true in classic baseball. Mets pitcher John Franco retired the first two batters he faced, but ran into trouble when Julio Franco walked, and Chipper Jones ripped a single up the middle to put runners on first and second. Not wanting to risk an implosion, Mets skipper Bobby Valentine replaced John Franco with Armando Benitez. The first pitcher from the usually reliable Benitez broke the tie game. Brian Jordan lined the pitch into the left center gap, earning him a double. The pinch runner for Julio Franco, Corey Aldridge, came around to score, making it a 2-1 game. Following the clutch double, the Braves concluded their scoring two batters later. However, the damage was done, and the Braves carried a 2-1 lead into the bottom of the eighth inning. Steve Carse, the native of Queens, a man who grew up a mere blocks from the confines of Shea Stadium, was called on to pitch in the bottom of the eighth for the Braves. Carse had been great to this point for Atlanta since being traded to the team in late June. He carried an ERA of 2.08 into the September 21st appearance and hadn't allowed a run in his previous 10 outings over his last 9.1 innings. He is exactly who the Braves want pitching with their slim postseason lead in the balance. He allowed Braves fans to exhale after the first batter, Matt Lawton, grounded out after a six-pitch battle. However, Carse then walked future Mets Hall of Famer Edgardo Alfonso on nine pitches. That battle proved to be a very crucial one. At this point, let me remind you of what's at stake here. This game is being played just 10 days after the September 11th attacks. America is reeling and searching every corner for a positive light. Although the New York Mets aren't the ideal image of America's team, they were for a night. As mentioned earlier, they were the first New York sports team to play at home since the tragedies. This game has taken on a human element above the sporting aspect. You can feel it in the cheering from the fans in attendance, and it's not too much of a far cry to say that their cheering was the voice of America searching for happiness. And for one night in September, while rescue workers were racing against time to search for survivors, the New York Mets were about to give a pulse to the city and the country again. Enter future Hall of Famer, Mike Piazza. Baseball, nothing in one. Marce has seen Piazza four times previously. Mike won for four against him. Lopez wants it away. And it's hit deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run. 
by Piazza, and the Mets lead three to two. On a night where millions tuned in to watch, a 1-0 pitch in Queens, New York, set forth the ability for Americans to exhale even if for a brief moment. After Mets broadcaster Howie Rose said the Mets had the lead, 42 seconds had passed before he spoke again. For those 42 seconds, the only thing you could hear on your television was the sound of elation inside a Shea Stadium. And that two-run home run would prove to be the game winner for the New York Mets. Take a look at this! He's got as much power as anybody. He got the arms extended. A long home run. And a curtain call. So Piazza, a two-run home run, and this place exploded. It's been waiting to explode all night. Well, Mike Piazza. Although he was sitting on the bench when Piazza sent the ball over the center field wall to decide the outcome of the game, Mark DeRosa, a utility player for the Braves, wasn't disappointed about losing on this particular night. In an interview with Moose and Maggie approaching the 20-year anniversary of the attacks, DeRosa said this about the game. It's the only game I ever played in where I was like, from pitch one, I wanted Jason Marquis to do well because he's my boy and he's from Staten Island, but I felt like we had to lose that game. And, and when he hit that homer, my... I looked at Bobby Cox real quick because I wanted that reaction because normally he would start throwing. I mean, stuff would get chucked in the dugout and he was like, yeah, everybody in the dugout was like, this needs to happen. And for that one small moment, it felt like people forgot for a, for a second about what was happening. You can attempt to debate it if you want about the Braves and if they were trying to lose that game. But one thing is for sure. The game cemented a legacy as one of the most impactful games in all of MLB's storied history. Following their dramatic win on September 21st, the Mets finished the season winning only half of the remaining 14 games. Their late season push did not result in a playoff appearance, as they missed out by six games in the standings. Their final record was 82 wins and 80 losses. For what would have been an otherwise unremarkable season, the Mets became America's team for a night and will forever hold the legacy of helping ignite the healing process for Americans. But what happened to the hats the Mets wore in response to the 9-11 attacks? Following the conclusion of the season, each Met signed their hat and sent them to be auctioned off for charity. Tens of thousands of dollars were raised, however, there were a couple hats that still made it to their players' houses and trophy cases. It still moves me every time I look at it, Robin Ventura said. It always reminds me of a guy named Chris Quackenbush. I played golf in his group in a Mets tournament. A week or so later, Bobby Valentine brought him to a game with his young son, CJ. I'll never forget the look on his son's face when he looked at his dad that day. It looked like, this is so great. I always wanted my kid to look at me like that. Then to hear that Chris was in the tower when it went down, Bobby still talks about him. I think about him and the look on his kid's face. And as for Todd Zeal, the man that helped start the whole movement, he keeps the hat in his baseball archive at home. I played for 11 teams and a lot of interesting things happened around me in my career, he said. But what is most memorable to me was playing in that 2000 World Series that was unbelievably special and what happened in and around 2001. It was all about the collective spirit of New York at work. Thank you all so much for watching. This video is made with a lot of help and a lot of resources. The number one article that was the big help in this one was the AM New York article referenced in the video. The voiceover that you heard in the video was my friend Tiger Allen at TA24 Cards on all the social medias you can find him at. And myself, my name is Noah. I'm at Bad Flip Baseball. I would love if you'd just take a second to subscribe. Thank you. Have a great one, guys. Peace.